Hi, my name is Jenny Devonshire and welcome to the Pause to Perform podcast, where we talk about all things relating to wellness, what you should take a pause for in your day to optimise your mental and physical health and perform at your peak. So welcome back to the Pause to Perform podcast with me, Jenny Devonshire. And this week is something a little bit different. Um, I am going to be the guest. So John, who was um, a, a previous guest on the podcast, suggested that he should interview me. So I am now going to pass over control to him and see where this goes. So welcome and thank you, John. Oh, great. And thank you, Jenny. Yeah, it's great. I think it always makes me think when I go and do other people's interviews, I bet people would much rather hear what you think than um, than anyone else. So uh with that in mind, um, would you tell people a little bit about yourself and um, your journey to where you are today? Okay. Well, it's, a, it's always a question of like, where do I start? So, um, well, at the beginning, I guess. So, um, yeah. So I started. Well, I think we'll start with my my degree, and then I'll go from there. So I went to uni and I studied psychology, and I absolutely love the subject. And then it got to like the end of the the three years and I wanted to do something else with it. But for one thing, I found it incredibly stressful because how our course was structured, we had like, it was all on our exams. And so we had like, so at the end of the the, um, the modules, we had a hundred percent riding on the exams. And so, and I think I had about six exams in one week. So should have started revising earlier but one thing I'd say about the educational system no one ever teaches you how to revise I've since studied Mm. that but they don't actually tell you how they go go and revise so anyway I found it incredibly stressful and so the thought of doing more exams I was like no and I thought about doing sports psychology at the time but I wasn't sure if it would lead into a job I didn't know it was a much smaller field than it is today thought about doing counselling but I felt like I was too young to um to to be a counsellor I guess so anyway so I didn't do that (laughs) I went off and went traveling a bit had a great old time um came back home and thought right I'll move to London because that's kind of what everyone does (laughs) Uh, so I moved to London and just got a job um in an insurance brokers and so I started working in the city and I absolutely hated it <laughs> and it was it was a really toxic culture it was like it was not a nice place to work um I was going to the gym like every sort of lunchtime and after work sometimes and I should go back and say so exercise has always been a big part of my life so I grew mm. up I was like horse riding and did gymnastics and then I had to give up riding when I was about 17 because I had dodgy knees and then I um so also at this time I had like quite bad anxiety and depression as a teenager didn't know what it was because we didn't talk about it in those days and um so I, I really struggled with that terrible insomnia um and then I got a job at a gym when I went to do my A-levels oh yeah I should also say I started doing my A-levels um and I this is when I was really struggling and I basically got stoned all the time because I was very unhappy <laughs> drinking so I dropped out of my A-levels the time round um so I went back to like start again and so I started going to the gym all the time and I realized that even though I had sort of this knee problem exercise made me feel good I felt um it, like my mental health was so much better so then yes yeah, so that kind of went so I did that so then well, anyway fast forward again to um working so went to the gym all the time and then I thought why don't I make something that I I love into my career so I did my personal training qualification but then I had always like been I was really really shy when I was a child like painfully shy even into being a teenager like I remember when I was a kid I used to have to get my mom to make phone calls for me because I was too too shy even when I was like a little bit older I remember going to restaurants like 16 17 or so and I would like my friends would have to order for me because I was too shy to to order no one would probably believe that now but that's what I was like and so when I so I did my my qualification and then I was I started like feeling like this the doubt that I was good enough to be a PT so I kind of like parked it for a while um and then I I actually got made redundant which is a very good thing at the time um and then I but instead of like pursuing it I think it was obviously like 
things out of my control saying like this is what you should be doing but I didn't listen got another job um in a corporate media company and I love the people so the the environment was great but I still hated the job I it was like it was either like super super stressful super super busy or I had nothing to do and for me having nothing to do is just awful um so anyways I was there for quite a long time again hated it was using you know um alcohol to try and cope I remember I had like Sunday fear from Saturday or basically from when I left on the <laughs> Friday it was awful and wow. then so anyway so I got made redundant again I obviously wasn't very good at one thing no I did but luckily this was like and I'd already actually funnily enough started teaching boot camps um already and I was already looking for a, a job as a PT because I'd finally got to that point where I'm like I need to do something different and luckily the redundancy money gave me um like this buffer to go into PT because because it is very difficult you're not you don't get a job you have to kind of build it up and mm. I remember when I first got made redundant I did start looking at other jobs like in like office space jobs and I was like no I know this is your opportunity to do something different so I got a job as a PT um so I got a job at Virgin Active and started doing PT and then all this self-doubt so the imposter syndrome came in and I started doing like course after course thinking like when I do this then I'll feel good enough so I was working with lots of people with like lower back or general sort of lower back pain and all those kind of things that are associated with working at a, at a desk all day and so I did my Pilates qualification still didn't feel like I knew enough then I did yoga but that was more just because I wanted to for my own just because I loved yoga basically and then um I yeah so the course after course never felt like good enough and then I decided to do like during the pandemic I um on a bit of a whim I signed up for a master's like as you do and I was <laughs> um, so, yeah, literally um so I was maybe on a holiday and um my friend was dating a guy at the time who was a sports psychologist and I was like you know what and she had recently done an MSc and I thought oh well oh I'll just do it then so I got back from holiday like researched like ones that were close signed up to um one and then I thought and then I got in and then I was like oh my god what am I doing and I remember like the first thing that we had to do is watch the previous cohorts presentations of their dissertations which is like mm. we had to do at the end and I remember going in there and just being like oh my god I can't do this um like what I I don't know what they're talking about like it's been so long since I've been in academia like, no way but because I like a I, I just don't I can't quit things or it's I didn't feel like I could but also not because I didn't feel like and it would be a bad thing necessarily it's just that I didn't really want to so I persevered and um it really did take away from the stress of the pandemic because I was very stressed about writing essays instead um, and I'm so glad that I did it because it proved to me that I'm more capable, well, A, I'm capable of working really hard. And also like what I was producing was pretty good. Um, and I think, and that's where I started studying imposter syndrome. And so I made it the subject of my research project. So, cause I did like loads of research and I came up with an intervention. And again, this being me, I basically, my my um my paper it probably should have been a PhD because it was like way beyond a kind of an MSc thing because it was massive but I'm glad I did it and it was it was like yeah really rewarding and I put together kind of an intervention for it and then so it's kind of a convoluted story now so then before I had signed up to the MSc I had started launching a corporate wellness company and the reason for this is because like a lot of my clients were professionals and I knew from working in an office how detrimental it can be for your well, mental and physical health and I like I really passionately believe that everyone deserves to feel good and I think you know in the workplace is the one place that you can make a real difference and so it's like so I do think that employers like they owe it to their employees to look after them and people shouldn't be giving up their health for their jobs because I feel like a lot of people do you know it's like this thing of like chasing wealth but then you can't buy your health back and so that's really what made me want to start course to perform and I think that when I started out it was more about 
oh just doing well from teaching I've seen you know I teach classes or you know workshops but you're not you know it's it's not it's not a tick box exercise that's not going to solve anything because for one thing if people don't like the yoga or the fitness what have you they're not going to do it and that's not going to help if they're going back to sort of like this toxic environment or anything like that so I wanted to put together like a really sort of a full of remarkable solution or something that like I actually something that really worked rather than was just like sort of lip service to oh we're looking after our employees because we're doing like a weekly meditation class but I feel like I've taught quite a lot then so I will stop now but yeah that is basically my journey <laughs> and that is what I do now. <laughs> wow and I had a look at the pause to perform website during the week as we were sort of um talking about having this chat and yeah it really is a comprehensive <laughs> uh offering isn't it it really yeah. seems to delve into every sort of aspect um of yeah helping people that could be in those kinds of environments um i'm sure we'll talk more about that stuff um shortly mm -hmm. but i was really interested you mentioned during that story and there's a lot you could talk about in there oh yeah. and you're um i can only imagine that your the top part of your letterhead when you list all of your qualifications must be enormous with your yoga qualifications and the pilates and then the and the bsc in the yeah in psychology and then also then just popping and popping a master's on there in the pandemic wow. yeah. yeah exactly <laughs> fully fully qualified um <laughs> but close to the start of um your answer there you mentioned um being very shy when you were younger and that sort of lasting into your teen years and um you also sort of jokingly mentioned that people might wouldn't think that now when they met you which we certainly wouldn't <laughs> so could you tell me a bit about that how did you how did you move from very shy child and into your teens to uh, the person that we all see before us and hear before us in these interviews now um i think a lot of it is just like forcing myself to do things that were like uncomfortable so I think first of all it was like teaching teaching a spin class I remember the first time I ever taught a spin class obviously I was really nervous but I was like right I'm just gonna do this so I decided so I just basically I just put myself in these positions so I, I signed up to teach a spin class I remember the first time you're sat on a bike with all these faces staring at you because obviously there's nowhere else for them to stare at and just be like right and I just did it and I initially I was really nervous and event and then with practice that became normal same thing with like Pilates like when I first did it I was like oh don't know what I'm doing but I just I just did it <laughs> um I just yeah just sign up to something then do it and then also it was um public speaking was something that I found well it was terrified me basically I remember when we were at uni um like my undergrad we had to do like um pre little mini presentations on on things and I remember my hands would be shaking you know when your voice does that kind of like wavery thing so I would do that so anyway so I was nervous about public speaking so I thought I know what I'm gonna sign up to give a talk so I basically <laughs> I signed up to this event to give a talk and again I was like really nervous but as soon as I got up there and I think I did the power pose so for anyone who doesn't know the power pose is so your sort of they say that your physiology affects your psychology and the power pose is standing with your sort of legs your feet about shoulder distance apart hands on hips like like a super super man super woman super person and then you just like stand and hold it for sort of 30 seconds or so and that helps give you confidence so I think I did that before and then also like you know using your breath to help calm down your nervous system so extending your exhalations and also to try and quieten down the thoughts so I think like one of the main things for me is just been if I find something uncomfortable then I'll just sign up to something that I can't like once I've signed up to it then I'm doing it so that's the way to go <laughs> so I think that's maybe it Wow, that's amazing. And I've heard you talk about that a couple of times before, actually. And that's um, that in itself is a nice takeaway for people, isn't it? That idea that you have a you have through necessity found your own method for uh, increasing your confidence in different areas because you you have a belief, you have a thing in your head that tells you if you make a commitment to doing it, you have to do it. Um, yeah, just that's great. So you just sign yourself up for the thing that you're worried about and then you have to do it. And you know that it will get easier as you do it. Is that 
Is that about right? Basically. And I think that kind of comes from my upbringing. So I remember when I was younger, like my parents sort of instilled that kind of work ethic of like you can't ring in sick if you're not sick. Um, you know, I remember at like school, they my mum wouldn't I had friends whose parents would like call in sick for them if they weren't actually sick. And my mum or, or work and my mum would never do that. She'd be like, no, you have to go. And so I think that's where kind of where it comes from. So now if I've got a commitment, I will I will be there unless something really happens that I really can't. And um it's funny I've seen in kind of within the fitness industry, you get a lot of people who will sort of like cancel their classes last minute but for me I'm like I can't I don't want to let people down so for me mm. if I say I'm going to do something I will do it yeah yeah fantastic and um I also I love the the bit of information there about the power pose and opening up your physiology and that's great so where did you um where did you discover that uh technique do you remember where you first heard about that or did it did it just sort of come to you as you were doing I your know. work I think I read about it somewhere I can't remember. I don't know if I was doing some research about confidence or something like that but I can't remember exactly but yeah when I heard about it I was like oh this is great and then I think it really does work because it's even things like you know when when people are depressed they tend to look down and mm -hmm. um you know even sitting up tall because also when you sit up like straight then you're you can use your full lung capacity so then you breathe better so it's all these things that tie in and like you know your body is a really a powerful way to kind of access different states and your breath so i think that's kind of all ties together there yeah and and um and again i'm sure this will come out later on in our chat but um because you have this pre-existing sort of fascination and genuine interest in how all this stuff works of course you it's a priority for you to go out and find this information and then you try stuff and you find what works and all the rest of it i suppose not everybody sat in their office is is maybe automatically aware of these things until somebody comes along and says oh you can do this try this yeah but it's yeah. funny that kind of ties into like you know whenever i've had like sort of this imposter syndrome or doubting myself i think someone said to me they were saying like you forget how much you know because it's been like for me all I've been studying for the last 10 or 15 years has been like health, longevity, like all these like psychology, psychological tips and tricks. And it's so because I think a lot of people, you like kind of discount your own knowledge because because you know it, you think that it must be everyone knows it. But not everyone has listened to all the podcasts I listen to about health and things like that. So, of course, they don't know the same things. And so that's kind of like I do really love sharing those things with other people because I know how beneficial it's been for me. So if I can make like a little difference for someone else and that's like really rewarding. Yeah. Wow. And that, speaking of really rewarding, why is it that you are so passionate about employee well-being? Well, I think it's because I like I'm I know how good you can feel <laughs> and it's funny because I was like you know getting a little bit older and I've got friends or like family members that say like they ache all the time or they're tired all the time and I'm like I'm just not and I know that you know you can feel great you can wake up in the morning without an alarm and be ready for your day you know you can eat nutritious food and you can feel great and I just feel like everyone deserves to feel that good and everyone, you know, everyone deserves to be, um, be happy. And well, obviously you can't be happy all the time, but to be in a constant state where you're not sort of even performing or feeling at your best, like I just really want everyone to feel better and enjoy their lives to the fullest, I guess. And it's funny because um, I was thinking about this earlier and it's like, unfortunately, <laughs> people can't do things, like people can't, you can't exercise for people so you can't you can get a PT and they can like help you or to motivate you you could get a private chef or you can get food delivered but you have to like eat that food mm. and not eat all the like processed things so it's one of those things that no one can do for you but obviously there's some people like really really hate exercise and this is why I'm doing um I'm training well I'm about to start another training because I still love training um to be a sport and exercise psychologist and it's about like and I'm actually doing a course on motivational interviewing 
And so motivational interviewing is kind of to help people overcome their ambivalence to change. So it's not telling people what to do. It's not telling what they should do. It's helping them, meeting them where they are and helping them to make their own changes because people have to do that for themselves. But obviously, if it was easy, then everyone would be doing it. So it's helping people to get to that point um, and making those small changes so that they can feel the best that they possibly could. Wow. And yeah, all of that sounds incredible. And I'm, and I'm sure it's a big part of why that pause to perform uh, program and um, offering is is so great. And I'm just wondering, is there was there anything earlier on in your experience? Because you mentioned in your uh, story at, at the start about having had some negative experiences in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, um, the work that you do now, trying to improve people's, obviously their productivity, but primarily their experience whilst that mm -hmm. work and all the rest of it. Um, how do you think that might have changed things for you? If you'd had a program like the one you're offering now, do you think things might have been different for you in your earlier work? Yeah, well, I think I would have been happier at work, but at the same time, what I was doing wasn't what I was kind of destined to be like doing. But also I was like, so I've done work recently. So I did my acceptance commitment therapy course. Yes, another training guys. Um, it's and a it's very all... long look ahead, Jenny. Oh, it's very long. Um, but it, it was very much about like your values and like living in line with your values. And for me, um, so I think it was like autonomy or freedom was kind of one of my top ones. So for me, I think, being employed, I would always find that challenging because it's not, it's not, because even though, you know, if you've got a different job and they allow you a little bit more autonomy, I don't think it's quite enough for me. And also like creativity. I I love the fact that I can create and I was actually, I'm doing a workshop um, with, with a friend on creativity and play state. And mm. we were saying about how, you know, creativity, it doesn't necessarily mean like drawing or things like that. It's kind of, it can be any kind of creation or what have you. And so I love the fact that I get to do all these different things and, you know, I'm never going to get bored because there's always another course, but also you're always learning and growing. And so I think even if like this was in place for me, it wasn't, I think like just being at the work in a workplace and being doing this like the same things probably wasn't right for me because of like of my values and my personality but it would have made the experience a lot better <laughs> yeah wow absolutely and i suppose your um your ability and uh to have the the energy required to do that the creative thinking or for you um to seek out a new path is um is only really possible if it's underpinned by good health, presumably. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, some people think, oh, well, A, this sort of like, I don't have time for, for looking after myself or things like that. But really, like, if you look after yourself, if you're healthy, you are more productive, so you get more done. So taking that time out to do, it doesn't even have to be that long, but, you know, going to bed at a decent time, like sleep is a sort of foundation for all. But and, and I know a lot of people sort of work, they get home and they want that kind of downtime. And but there's a thing called um, sleep procrastination where people put off going to bed. But life is so much easier when you're well rested. And there's so much research about like how important sleep is. I remember reading this book called Why We Sleep by um, I think it's Matthew Walker. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. And um, I remember reading it and being like, oh, my goodness, it's so important. And like I guess for me as well because I had such terrible um, insomnia when I was younger and into like my 20s I now like sleep is like kind of my top one of my top priorities like I know like getting good sleep means that you will function better you're like it's so so important for your mental health you know you can concentrate more so um so yes so I think like health underpins everything and you know you only have one body and you really do need to look after it and like I say it doesn't mean you have to spend hours in the gym and all this kind of stuff it's little things can be done to improve it and um and it just just makes life easier which is always a good thing yeah absolutely um and so speaking of that you mentioned um 
how in, the importance of sleep and being well rested. What are some common mistakes that people make when they are trying to improve their health? <laughs> health or sleep? Um, well, I was going to broaden it out to health, but it's up to you. Yeah. I'll do yeah. both. <laughs> um, I think like, for the health thing, it's when, when people are trying to make sort of new habits or change, the tendency is to try and change everything at once. So it's like, you know, New Year's resolutions, typical example, to go, right, I need to go to the gym five times a week. I must eat only healthy food or try literally trying to change everything all at once. And that really is setting you up for failure. I can't remember the exact like statistics on it, but it was something like if you do try and change one thing, the chance of success is like 80 or 90 percent. Well, as soon as you introduce a second one, I think it dropped like 50. It was a, a big drop mm. just from two things. So if you're trying to change everything, then your risk is probably not going to last. So first of all, I would say it's like, yeah, trying to make really, really small changes. Um, I've also read quite a few books on like habits. And one of them was like called, I think, Tiny Habits. And it's like, really make it tiny <laughs> like and i think in the book it's saying like things like if you want to do exercise do one squat or one press up a day and it may sound silly but that if you're going to do like make a commitment and if you start doing that every day then you're like oh well i've done one i might carry on but you don't ever put the pressure to do more and then once it becomes a habit because habits are the best way to, for us to do things because it takes the thought out of it so it seems like you we don't need to think about brushing our teeth we just do it so if you can then make it into a habit, it makes it much easier. So I think that's one thing. So making it small and just doing one thing. Um, and also, I think like having like perfectionist tendencies around it. So it's that thing of like why diets often don't work is if people are really restrictive, then they'll have like, let's say have one biscuit. They'll be like, right, that's it. Um, I've messed it all up. Therefore, I'm going to eat the entire packet of biscuits. And then, mm -hmm. and like that day is like, that's it, rather than just stopping after that initial, what they call a slip up. But I mean, I think so, making yeah, it, so trying to be perfect and trying to have this perfect routine and I'm going to do all these things. It's like just, like, A, don't beat yourself up if like you do some, if you like don't do what you intended to do. Um, mm -hmm. So, they, I think those are the main ones. And yeah, and don't, yeah, don't give up if if you don't if you have a day when something hasn't gone to plan of, of your whatever you're trying to change just draw a line under it and start again don't see it as a failure and don't see it as you failing as a person I think that's another thing that people can often do you know beat mm -hmm. yourself up like oh I've failed again I'm useless all these kind of things that you can spiral into um and just yeah that's it really <laughs> that's a few tips from, from me yeah that's great I love the um the idea of uh, focusing on building the healthy habit, uh, you know, the idea of consistently doing the, you know, the one press up a day or whatever mm -hmm. it is. So that, that's a, that's brilliant. And I'm sure that's really powerful for people. Yeah. yeah. There's also there was something in the, in the book and it was saying like, if you want to start going to the gym, just go to the gym. You don't have to do anything. Just make a habit of getting to the gym. And I think oh, that's a great one because once you're there, you might decide to do it. But if that's all, you know, if you've got a bit of a sort of blockage to doing it, just getting to the gym and making that into a habit, that's a great start. Yeah, you're automatically in, you've automatically taken yourself out of sort of a negative feedback loop of consistently doing unhealthy things and feeling mm -hmm. bad. And you've straight away put yourself in the positive feedback loop of, I said I'd go to the gym. I went to the gym. Yeah, you know, exactly. It's great. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And also, I feel like once it is it, a lot of these things, like kind of, if you do one of the of one sort of thing, it will then cascade. So if you do, do exercise, it doesn't have to be the gym either. It could be anything. It could be dancing around your living room. It could be going for a walk. Something that you enjoy. That is really important. Um, so once you've you've done like kind of the exercise, you'll probably feel that you want to eat better because you feel like I want I've done this to look after my body. Therefore, I want to nourish it with good food. And then maybe I won't have that alcoholic beverage or, you know, it just tends to work in that sort of one thing. And then like dominoes, I guess it just like flows from there. Yeah. Oh, great. That's fantastic. Thank you, Jenny. Um, you've spoken a bit about some of the uh, the difficulties for individuals mm -hmm. um, with uh, maybe improving their health. And then you've um, given some great 
actionable tips there about how people can start to move in a, a healthier direction. I'm wondering, um, what about for companies? What are the big benefits for companies of putting in place a well-being initiative? Well, first of all, I think there's like there's so many reports now, you know, mental health is at an all time well low, I guess. Um, you know, there was um a a report from Gallup um just come out that said that, you know, stress levels were uh, like I think it was 34% of people reporting feel stressed. It might have been higher, but there was like, you know, a lot of um employees are disengaged. So what that means is they're either um like not gonna be productive at work. They're like quiet quitting, which is, you know, you're not you're not really there, but you're there in body. And then a lot of people are actually looking for new jobs. So, you know, you've got your turnover costs, if replacing staff if people are leaving or, or not being productive. So it's it has so many benefits. You know, if you've got a company that looks after their staff, they're more likely to um, advocate for that company. And um, there's, you know, they've got all these sort of staffing problems at the moment. So people are struggling to attract talent. So if, if it's like, if people are saying that it's a great place to work, you're more likely to be able to attract new staff. And so, and obviously the people who are there are more productive and happy. So it is really important and it's beneficial for the bottom line, as well as like, you know, I think everyone wants their employees to be happy, um, but it doesn't have to be at a cost to like the company's performance. In fact, it will actually benefit them. Yeah, I think I saw your post about that Gallup uh, survey. And yeah. was it $8.8 trillion mm. they estimate? That disengagement yeah. is costing the yeah. economy as a whole. Yeah, That's it's massive. Yeah, it's yeah. huge. So it is something that really needs to be addressed. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely amazing. And um what is it that um what are the sort of principal parts of what you and Pause to Perform do uh, to help companies address those things? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for asking that. Well, basically, I think a lot, I did like a lot of research into kind of like what makes a well-being initiative successful. And like the main thing it's like a lot of companies miss is finding out what the staff need. So it's all very well, like offering a weekly yoga class or like meditation or what have you. But if that's not what the employees need, then it's basically a bit of a waste of money. So it's like coming in and finding out. So at the moment, financial well-being, very important. So, yeah, finding out the actual needs of the employees. And then it's kind of working with the leadership team because, if the leadership team aren't bought into it and they're not leading by example, then they can't expect the employees to do anything. And like a lot of things that I've seen, it's like kind of putting the responsibility on the employee. Um, and it needs to be like, obviously people have to take responsibility for their own health because you no, know, like I said before, no one can do it for them, but it's also up to the company to provide um, a cultural wellness that's, like supportive and um that they can feel like they're safe so psychological safety is really important um and having that open communication channels so it's working with the leadership team uh, to make sure that they kind of understand see if they need any training around like supporting staff and then it's from there it's um depending on what um what the needs are it's like a series of kind of workshops for the employees but I think like the problem with a lot of like these workshops, you know, you learn all these things, but if you're not putting them into place, then it's a bit like, you know, null and void. So it's that's when the kind of like coaching side comes in to help with the motivational interviewing to kind of help people to implement that change. So it's like an ongoing process depending on the needs. And then it's from there, it's kind of ongoing support so that to keep it going. So it's not like, right, come in and fix it because it's not a quick fix thing um it takes it takes um a commitment from everyone and then i also have like an online portal um where um, employees can access like so there's various different things there's things about like sort of how to manage stress anxiety things like that but also things like like you know musculoskeletal um disorders are very prevalent and that creates a lot of kind of medium to long-term absences. So it's things like, you know, RSI, neck pain, all those kind of things that are sciatica. So covering all of those, as well as kind of exercise videos and stuff that people can do. So it's kind of a bit of everything, all in, all in one program. Yeah, wow, all in one place as well. Yeah, that's um, that's fantastic. And do you know, there's one thing I, um, I wanted to ask you about earlier that perhaps will feed into some of this. Mm -hmm. um, you'd mentioned, um, 
you'd mentioned all of those areas that you studied obviously in great mm -hmm. depth whether it's the the yoga and the pilates and the psychology and all of those things and when you describe the program that you're offering to organizations it's clear that you've brought so many of these different areas together mm -hmm. um, to produce this solution and what i'm wondering is um you then mentioned that you'd done this uh, msc in sports <laughs> psychology mm -hmm. um during COVID. so i'm just wondering um how do you plan to use that um and what made you want to do it in the first place and does that how has that knowledge um affected the work you do with organizations very good question um so the reason i did it like i say it was a bit of a whip no i'd always wanted i was always interested in it um because um it's something that i thought about doing years ago because i was obviously in like more more of like fitness rather than sport but i was you know active being active has always been very important to me um and then so i decided to do it and what has really brought me is Real, knowing again how to or realizing I guess that I can read academic literature and understand it and take things from it because it was all very much theory based so I've learned so the topics we did was like motivation um attention um so like sort of things like mental imagery and things like that and so the, the thing I've kind of taken from it is the performance side because for me performance is like another thing that I'm really passionate about so mm -hmm. performing at your best like how can you get the best out of yourself and so that's kind of where what I kind of got from it, I guess. And then that's to, uh, to do the sport and exercise psychology, you have to do the MSc. So that's led into this further training. And how I want to use that or how I will be using that um, is using these kind of things for behavior change but applying it in the workplace. So I'm going to do so for the for the quantification, we have to do um like re like a research project or I want to do a research project um because I quite like the research side of it um so it's kind of like how to best make change in the workplace like trying out different things and yeah so basically bringing in that psychology for the performance but also for the behavior change so that people can like you know change make these healthy choices so then they also perform better so I guess that's kind of how it all ties in great yeah, it's so interesting. There's there's a lot of people, aren't there, out there doing um, tiny bits of the puzzle, right? Mm. There's you know there's people doing this, this, and this for this, um, but it's great to see someone who's sat down and really thought, well, what is what are all the pieces I need to bring in to make this really work and really yeah. impactful for people? Um, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, I think we might be coming towards the end of our time. So I have <laughs> one more question that I want to talk about because I've heard you ask it in your uh, podcast interviews. So uh, what's, and I'll use the words as closely as I can to yours, what's one thing you recommend people take a pause for in their day to improve their mental and physical health and optimize their performance? Well, there are so many things, but as I always ask this for people, I think probably sleep i know that's like not taking a pause for so i would say the pause for is um to take to do a, a bedtime routine to so basically sleep hygiene so I, I didn't really touch on this earlier so it's probably a good place to say but so yeah obviously i did really struggle with insomnia so i know firsthand how bad it is and how i kind of overcame it obviously still sometimes have bad night sleeps but it's not every night and that was when I went to India and did my yoga training. Look, we didn't have um, we didn't have phones because they didn't well they did work but it would have cost a fortune. So I didn't have my phone. We didn't have a TV. We didn't have anything. And so I was going to bed um, having not been like blue light and like stimulated, and I actually slept. So when I came back, I kind of vowed to myself that I am going to turn everything off at nine p.m. and I. I do do still do that. Everyone laughs at me. All my friends say, don't message Jenny after nine o'clock because she won't have a phone on. So, like, so for me, so sleep, things you can do to improve your sleep or your sleep hygiene, get away from your screens. Um, ideally two hours before, but you know, an hour. So if you want to go to bed at 10, stop watching TV at nine and you know, turn your phone off. I know it's like hard, but it it makes honestly it makes such a difference. You can get blue light blocking glasses, but you're still being stimulated. So I think it's much better just to turn everything off. Then your brain's like, just take time just to like calm everything down. 
Um, so I, I really like doing um, sort of some, I do foam rolling and stretching, but obviously that's not necessarily, it takes a bit longer. This is not a brief pause, but yeah, to just take, even if it's like three minutes, five minutes maybe of just breathing or having like a you know, shower maybe, but just quietening everything down, getting ready for bed, getting your brain to just switch off. So, you know, if you're sort of on emails and then you're trying to get straight into bed, it's you're probably not going to be able to sleep that well. So there's other things that you can do as well. So it's like having a hot shower is meant to really help or a bath because you raise your, well, it actually helps to lower your body temperature. So you would want to, to induce sleep. You want to have like, um, we want to cool down the core, core body temperature. So that's why having a cool bedroom or like if you have access, a sauna. But um, yeah, so try and like, so you want to like, yeah, if you get hot, it helps to cool you down. So cool bedroom, a dark bedroom. So if you've got, um, if you do have light coming in the curtains, um, I've actually just bought um, a thing from Amazon, oh, should not going to advertise, from an online retailer. Um, it's like a blue, um, like a blackout thing that you can just stick on the window. It's really, my bedroom is now completely dark. So yeah, you, you won't have no lights. So if you've got like a light on the TV or anything like that, just trying to block it. So complete darkness um wind down and um yeah breathe maybe beforehand so yeah sleep hygiene will help once you sleep better you'll wake up feeling more refreshed that impacts on like of your whole day you're more likely to eat better because if you have poor like sleep then you crave more sugary food so basically that's a very long answer but sleep <laughs> <laughs> that's great jenny thank you very much for uh answering my question which i've been pondering since we first met and uh, yeah, look forward to listening to the next podcast. Yeah. And thank you very much for asking. And um, yes, so thank you very much for listening, everyone. And hopefully you enjoyed that and uh, check in again soon. You've been listening to the Pause to Perform podcast with me, Jenny Devonshire. If you enjoyed the show, I'd really appreciate it if you could rate, review and subscribe. This helps other people find it. And hopefully I can help more people to improve their mental and physical health and optimise their performance.